All right. Hello and welcome back to the 25th annual George Mason Law Review Antitrust Symposium, celebrating 25 years of antitrust. My name is Carly Veeding, and I am the symposium editor for the George Mason Law Review. This event is brought to you by the George Mason Law Review and the Global Antitrust Institute, and our sponsors are Freshfields and CRA. We have had a fantastic week of programming, and we thank our audience and participants for their support of this year's symposium. With that, I'm pleased to open our final event of the week, Competition in the Americas. Our moderator is Judge Douglas Ginsburg, Senior Judge on the U.S. Court of Appeals for the D.C. Circuit and Professor of Law at George Mason University Antonin Scalia Law School. Judge Ginsburg. We're going to hear from, uh, from three uh, uh, really great uh, speakers, experts on competition in the Americas. Uh, and I'll, I'll tell you in order who they will be and then turn it over to, uh, to them to get us going. We're going to hear first from uh, Russ da uh, Damtoft. Russ is the, um, is the Associate Director of the Federal Trade Commission, U.S. Federal Trade Commission's Office of International Affairs. Uh, he's responsible there for relationships uh, between the FTC and the antitrust agencies uh, throughout the Americas, and um, as well as in some developing countries. And he also uh, represents the Federal Trade Commission uh, at UNCTAD, the UN agency, and at um, OECD uh, in their Latin American and Caribbean competition forum. So Russ has been uh, with the commission uh, for a long time, since 1985. Uh, and um, in what spare time they allow him, he's now become a, an adjunct professor at Georgetown Law School, where he teaches an advanced antitrust course primarily for LLM students who come from all over the world to get their LLM at, uh, at Georgetown. Uh, after Russ, we'll hear from, uh, from Alexander uh, Cordero uh, Macedo. I always have a little difficulty with that name. Uh, and uh, Alexander is now the president. This is the top dog. This is El Presidente uh, of CAGE, the Brazilian competition agency more formally known as the Administrative Council for Economic Defense. And before becoming the uh, president, not fairly recently, uh, Alexander was the superintendent, which made him the, uh, the chief of the enforcement arm of the agency. And before that, a commissioner uh, with the agency. So he's had all of these roles uh, now culminating in, uh, in being the president. And while doing all this, he's been a visiting professor at uh, several universities in Brazil and some elsewhere. And he is, I'm very pleased to say, a uh, 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 um, exact title here, a visiting scholar and inter international fellow here at the Global Antitrust Institute at Antonin Scalia Law School. We've been really pleased to have him present with us when he's been able to spend time here. And then we'll hear from, uh, <clears throat> pardon me, from Melanie Aiken. Melanie is the uh, co-chair of the Bennett Jones firm's competition and foreign investment practice. Um, she specializes in Canadian uh, aspects of global competition law and litigation, not surprising because uh, she was the uh, commissioner, which again is the top dog, the commissioner of uh, uh, competition bureau in Canada for a long spell from 2009 to 2012. Um, and before that, she was uh, in charge of merger review. So Melanie's been practicing uh, uh, with uh, Bennett Jones now since she left uh, the commission uh, and has really developed an expertise in, in mergers as well as other aspects of uh, Canadian competition law, uh, which of course interacts so closely with, uh, with that in, uh, in the US. Russ, um, I've given you a big buildup. Uh, tell us what you think is going on, what is um, current trends, uh, I don't know if trends can be current, but, but trends that are still uh, still in play uh, throughout the Americas, uh, maybe some of the background against which uh, uh, this operates, um, and whatever the uh, challenges are that you see going forward for these, some of them very large and others rather small and, and newer agencies. Thank you, Judge Ginsburg, and thanks to the law school for inviting me to speak on this very important program today. I'll start with uh, the normal disclaimer that the views I express today are my own and don't necessarily represent the views of the Federal Trade Commission or any individual commissioner. 
Uh, I will add one additional disclaimer, which is that my mind is in many ways elsewhere today. This morning, you heard Bill Kavasik mention the efforts of the FTC with support from the US Agency for International Development to strengthen antitrust enforcement in Ukraine. I've been deeply involved in that effort and our thoughts and good wishes are with our colleagues in Ukraine. But returning to the topic at hand, I also acknowledge the FTC has a strong and deep relationship with our counterparts in Brazil, Canada, and many others. Since Melanie and Alexandra are much better qualified to talk about what's going on in those countries, I will speak about the rest of the region, which I have followed for the FTC for over 20 years. And for today's purposes, I will also exclude the United States from the Americas. The US is at the cusp of a possible major realignment of its competition enforcement system and policy. And we're collectively reflecting on how best to reflect the egalitarian aims of our original antitrust statutes. Others who have already spoken on this program are better positioned to speak about that than I am. So I will leave that debate to them. Since this is a 25th anniversary conference, let's look at the antitrust landscape in the Americas 25 years ago in February of 1997. The United States, Canada, and Chile had robust competition regimes, but competition law and policy elsewhere in the hemisphere were in their infancy. Brazil, Mexico, Peru, Colombia, and Venezuela had only recently passed modern competition laws and set up agencies to enforce them, as had Jamaica, Costa Rica, and Panama. Argentina had a law in the books, but had yet to establish a real enforcement agency. The tasks they had before them were huge. Competition and free markets were not part of the economic DNA of most of the Americas. The economic foundation of the Spanish empire revolved around a system of state monopolies all in the service of the Spanish crown. Alexandra will know better whether this was true in Portuguese Brazil, but I think that was the case. And in some countries, the monopolistic history went even deeper. Several years ago, I was touring Mexico's marvelous Museum of Anthropology, and I came into a room with an exhibit on the economic system of the Aztecs. My Spanish is pretty weak, but the word monopolio jumped out at me. And what I learned was their system was built entirely on a network of monopolies. Independence from Spain didn't change much other than cutting the king out of the picture. In the following two centuries, the economies of the Americas were kept on the, under the watchful control of the state. There were a few powerful private operators, but they were closely affiliated with the governments. Now, I've been to many countries in Latin America where I've been told that the country's whole economy is controlled by a select number of families. The number varies from country to country, uh, but in most of them, you can count them on a single hand. I mentioned earlier, some of my work has been in the former Soviet Union. And while the politics of Latin America and the Soviet Union were quite different, there were some remarkably distinct economic resemblances between communism and Latin America of the mid 20th century. However, in the last decades of the 20th century, economies began to open up. The value of free markets came to be understood and privatization and competition followed. But the transition was not always informed by competition concerns. It wasn't well understood. And sometimes privatization had the effect of transforming state monopolies into private monopolies. This was the case, for example, with Mexico's Telmex. In environments like this, the transformational challenges faced by pioneer competition advocates of a quarter century ago were overwhelming. But what followed was a truly remarkable exercise in institution building and changing expectations. Dynamic new institutions were created under the leadership of people like Beatriz Boza in Peru, Ana Julia Hatar in Venezuela, Fernando Sanchez Ugarte, and then Eduardo Perez Mota in Mexico, and an unbroken string of Brazilian giants beginning with Jesner Oliveira and continuing right through the present with Alexandre Cordero. Leaving aside Venezuela, they grew into strong institutions that became ever more effective in taking on cartels, 
and monopolistic practices of the sorts that had victimized generations of Latin Americans. Mexico gives us a good example. I mentioned the privatization of uh, Mexico's landline monopoly a minute ago. Telmex then extended that monopoly into mobile services by charging high interconnection fees to its would-be rivals in the wireless market. And the OECD studied the Mexican telecom market, included that the monopolistic overcharges, which fell most heavily upon the poor, cost the Mexican economy 129 billion per year. That's real money anywhere. Unsurprisingly, Telmex's owner reportedly became the richest man in the world. Now, Mexico's competition agency took on Telmex and ultimately prevailed. We hear lots of claims for what is the antitrust battle of the century, but I think that case is a good candidate for that title. So the competition authorities of Colombia, Peru, and Chile, not to mention Brazil, uh, developed the capacity to detect and sanction cartels that had victim, victimized their citizens in many ways in markets including bread, chickens, grain, and most famously, toilet tissue. Others joined in. In the last 25 years, about a dozen countries, such as El Salvador, Honduras, and Ecuador, also passed competition laws and set up new agencies. Regional bodies and laws were established as well, including the Andean community and the multinational Caribbean community, known as CARICOM. And today there's only five countries in the hemisphere that do not yet have competition laws, a list that includes Haiti and Cuba and a few others. This is quite a testament to the idea that robust competition is vital to reforming economies and promoting the well-being of their citizens. However, success applying antitrust law inevitably provokes reactions, and not all of them good. I would divide these into three categories. First, if you break the hold of a small group of well-connected oligarchs, it's going to make powerful figures unhappy. If I were using slides today, I'd show the movie poster for The Empire Strikes Back, complete with the background theme music for Darth Vader's entrance. Uh, those oligarchs are not without political power. Second, Interventions of competition agencies have led some governments to question whether competition authorities are too independent. Latin America does not have a deep tradition of agencies that it can force the law independent of what the government thinks. And third, the shift to the left in many governments and economies has raised questions about whether unfettered market forces should be presumed to be the appropriate guide for setting economic policy. The latter, of course, is the subject of robust debate here as well. However, the combination of these factors can create a political witch's brew in Latin America. And indeed, Latin American antitrust agencies are feeling the pushback. For example, Venezuela's commitment to markets dissolved in the late 1990s, and the agency as we had known it has been eviscerated. Mexico's current government has voiced skepticism about market forces and made it clear that COFESE and other independent agencies have been too independent. COFESE felt this first through salary cuts and then through efforts to push through a law to weaken the agency. Those efforts didn't succeed, so now the government is now pushing policies that would reverse the effects of market-based reforms in the energy sector in favor of less efficient state-owned producers. Vacancy on COFESI's board have not been filled, leading concerns about whether COFESI can maintain a quorum. Questions have also been raised in Peru and Chile about whether the competition there, agencies there, are too independent uh, and should be more subservient to the political process. In Argentina, the agency had been largely marginalized for many years, but in 2015, pro-market forces came back to power and an extraordinary team under Esteban Greco brought new life to the agency. And a law was passed that would create a genuinely independent agency and tribunal. However, after the 2019 elections, the government changed 
and the current government has not implemented the new law. So what lies ahead? To quote that great antitrust scholar, Yogi Berra, it's tough to make predictions, especially about the future. The debates that we see around the globe about whether the consumer welfare standard has been interpreted too narrowly and whether we have erred on the side of under enforcement are happening in Latin America as well. To varying degrees, agencies in the region, and, and here I will include the US, are reflecting on whether the consumer welfare standard should be revisited. What is the impact of anti-competitive conduct on marginalized communities? How can agencies best counter the digital behemoths under existing law? How best to address acquisitions involving nascent competitors and so on? We see similar moves to address, uh, for example, digital markets as competition agencies in Mexico, Brazil, Colombia and Chile are ramping up their in-house capabilities to investigate digital markets. Just as we at the FTC are increase, increasing the use of technologists to help us understand how these markets work and be better and more forward looking in our enforcement and policy. However, this discussion appears to be happening mostly within the competition agencies and within the competition community. Leaving aside our own country, there seems to be less interest on the part of governments as a whole, uh, and it's taking place in economies very different from our own. So to sum it all up, the system of monopolies that persisted for centuries in Latin America created a very predictable but unequal standard of living. It created static economies that did not encourage dynamic growth, but were very good at protecting the interests of a few. The move to liberalize markets in the closing years of the 20th century created opportunities for innovation and prosperity, but this shook up entrenched interests and that created a backlash by the powerful elite. Meanwhile, countries have shifted left politically and with it, there's been an increase in protectionism and state intervention across the economy and not just when there are market failures. We hope that competition agencies and competition proponents around the globe, including in the US, will be able to support our counterpart agencies as they look to remain independent to enforce the law against harmful monopolies, cartels, and potentially anti-competitive mergers. I believe that a key issue for them, as well as for us, is how do we make the case that a healthy and fair competition leads to improvements in the lives of our respective citizens. Gracias, obrigado, merci. What you've said, your remarks portray what seems to me a very challenging moment in the evolution of competition in, uh, in, the, re in the region. And maybe even more so than it is here, I think because the, here and in Europe, because the, the grip of competition was more tenuous uh, to begin with against the long history that you've portrayed. I, I, hope, uh, I hope Alexander can relieve us of some of the depressing, <laughs> depressing uh, aspect of that report. Um, so uh, Alexander, but I do hope Alexander that you'll, you'll comment on some of the things that, that, that Russell said as you go along. Okay, thank you, thank you, Doug. It's a, a, it's a pleasure on time uh, to be here. Um, so about Lat about Latin America, spe especially um, in South America, we have um, a lot of developments coming in. Um, uh, especially in Brazil, um, we had we we still calling the new law, but it's not the new law anymore because we have like we're going to be ten years about this law. Um, but uh, you know that uh, to make a law uh, work and really, uh, you know, be accepted by the country, it take a while uh, because the people get, have to get uh, to have used to the law, and and also the market have to understand what the antitrust authorities is uh, its understanding about the law, and this is a construction. Um, and in Brazil, a lot of things changed uh, with this new law, antitrust law. Uh, one of the big changes was the uh, 
We change for the post uh, not notification in, in merging acquisition for the pre-notification aspects. So now in Brazil, uh, in this, I, I, in my opinion, this was the, uh, the biggest change. Um, just uh, for, uh, to have an idea, before the law, uh, Kaji would take like two years to analyze and approve or reprove a merging acquisitions. Now, our average is 28 days. It's like we're talking about two years against 28 days. And at that time, when Kaji was like um, analyzing our merging acquisition and decide to block the, the deal, um, the, the, the company was already operating together for the past two years. So it would be very easy to go to the court and ask for injunction and, okay, stop Kaji's decision and let's wait the judiciary decide uh, later. So, but the judiciary uh, take kind of 10 years in Brazil to decide a case. And I have a very good example right now. We have a case that is still in the discussion by the judiciary for the past 16 years. And this case was notified uh, to Kaji in 2002. Kaji's decision was to block the operation in 2004, and the case is still under scrutiny by the judiciary. So after, it's, it's unbelievable. After, after uh, the new law with the pre-notification uh, 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 regime, we don't have these injunctions anymore. Look, the structure of incentive for the judges, it's completely different because now they cannot get together, start to operate before the CAD's decision. And so when they start the deal, they have to ask Kaji, and if Kaji block the operation, no judge will say, okay, you can consume the operation and let's see what's going to happen after. No, the decision is let's Kaji say uh, what they have to say and let's wait the antitrust authority to analyze the case. And this was a huge change, a very big change. Besides that, we have also lenience uh, a, a very strong leanings program that was uh, was was brought by the new law with a lot of uh, in, uh, incentives uh, preserving the golden rule and 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 more facility to make the deals and the agreements and the settlements. Uh, but also uh, one thing that we changed then and was very uh, very important was change the structure of the uh, agency. Uh, the role of antitrust in Brazil was divided in three institutions uh, in different ministries in the Brazilian government. This law got every role and put inside of the agency. This made us more powerful with more enforcement and also uh, with more security to the market because it's just one decision and not three decisions anymore how it used to be. And I see in, in, in America that a lot of um, other jurisdictions look to the Brazilian law and say, okay, this is one of good thing that I can bring to my country, especially when I'm talking about the structure, when we're talking about the leanings, the pre-notification regime of merging acquisitions, and, 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 and we know that there is a kind of um, uh, different uh, regimes about the relation with the agents and the, uh, and the judiciary, uh, how they have to challenge the, the decisions from the agents to the judiciary, and this change by country. And in Brazil, we have a, a, a very different uh, uh, regime. Uh, our decisions, can be uh, can be uh, discussed at the judiciary or you know challenge at the judiciary, but there is some limits, and these limits is very important to preserve the agency decisions. So the judiciary 
cannot touch in the merits of the decision, cannot talk about competition. They cannot talk about procedures, due process, but not the merits. And more than that, uh, if you are analyzing a merger acquisition and we need to block the operation, we just block the operation. We don't have to challenge that and go to the judiciary like FTC has to do it. We just block the operation and done. This is the final, re- final decision. If the party do not agree, they can go to this re- judiciary and they have to prove that my decision is wrong. But the judiciary cannot touch in the merits. Just if I did some, uh, I make some mistake about the procedures. But the final decision is a CAD's decision. And what is good and what is bad in this situation? It's just only bad if the agents is not doing a, a, a good job, is not strong, there is no enforcement, there is a lot of political influence. But it's very good if you don't have a political influence. We, we do have enforcement. It's very good to preserve this decision because the antitrust specialists is in the antitrust agents in Brazil. It's not in the judiciary. And in Brazil, there was a discussion about do we have to create um, some uh, specialized judge in antitrust? And my answer is, I don't think that this is a good idea, because if the judiciary cannot touch, cannot touch in the merits, why we need the specialized judges? So it's, and this is how the system in Brazil uh, works. And I think that other jurisdictions sometimes look to Brazil and say, should I bring this, uh, this system to Brazil, part of that? And I, I know that all of that is not, is not possible because there is have, they have to change even the constitution. But uh, the good practice, like the, our lenience program, our pre-merge notifications, uh, all, um, and structure that you can do by, you know, just simple law or some soft law, it's, it, we can influence uh, some, uh, some jurisdiction. You see Peru, for example, they just launched um, uh, a merging acquisition regime um, for, the whole co- for the whole country. It used to be just for electricity, uh, but now it's for the whole country. If you see Colombia, he's like, they are like, you know, growing a lot in a lot of issues. Uh, 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 Chile is already, has uh, Russell, uh, uh, told us was on. It was one of the uh, main countries that started the antitrust in uh, in Americas and especially in South America. And but I can see a lot of changes and just like it's a very uh, new news that we uh, yesterday we had a meeting with the president of Argentina, Brazil, uh, Uruguay, and Paraguay. We are doing an annuary. Um, a paper with all the four uh, presidents and the four jurisdiction about what we have been doing in our country, the good practice, and how antitrust should be working in America too. So this is one of uh, some important news as well. So, uh, Doug, I will stay here because I think that, um, Melanie, there is much more important things to say. <laughs> about what his, uh, she has been doing. Well, I appreciate what you've had to tell us about, uh, about Brazil. It's, uh, it's much more encouraging <laughs> than, than, uh, than we were able to, to get uh, as an impression from Russell's uh, report. Now, Melanie, of course, comes from the, the granddaddy of all national antitrust jurisdictions. I say national because I've learned only recently that our states of Iowa and Kansas in that order enacted the first antitrust laws in the world. That was in 1888. I don't know that it came to much at the time, but Canada did in 1889. And so around the world, Canada still thought to be the pioneer. And to this day, one of the major agencies in our 
in our uh, universe. So Melanie, what can you tell us to bring us up to date? <laughs> well, first of all, I want to say thank you so much for including me. Um, it's a pleasure to, to join all of you this afternoon. And I'm sorry, but I'm starting to look a little ethereal. The sun is doing funny things. So I'll try to manage <laughs> that. Although, as I was on a call earlier the day, we have all agreed that at our age, a little muting isn't, isn't the worst thing that can happen to you. Um, <laughs> but, uh, but thanks. And that can't possibly uh, match the tour de force um, from a historical perspective that Russ took us through. Uh, or probably excite you with uh, the innovations happening at Kaje, which actually that was the best description of it I've had. Um, I understand it now better than I ever have before. Um, I can also say that um, there is a lot of envy, I suspect, um, at certain agencies around the world with respect to the finality um, of your decisions. I think uh, certainly, I don't want to speak for others, but certainly I think if, had, had I been commissioner and had that ultimate say, it might have made me um, a little more comfortable uh, in some circumstances. In any event, I thought, um, since I can only really, uh, I can't offer those really unique perspectives from the inside, um, I'd just give a little bit of a quick update on what's happening in Canada. Um, we're continuing, just like everybody else in the world, to look um, at the Bureau, to look at Google, and to look, there's an open uh, investigation into Amazon. Those are the ones that are public. They've taken to a sort of a new approach to these things. They actually are publicizing uh, when they're investigating companies, which is somewhat of a new practice. I think perhaps um, a desire to be seen to be uh, doing things that are relevant, but I can't, I'm only speculating. Um, so far, uh, you know, there's a lot of talk about increasing capacity, uh, both from an intelligence perspective, from a human capacity perspective, from a tools perspective, to manage um, the digitized environment and, and big data, et cetera. Um, we haven't seen any cases uh, yet, but perhaps we will. Um, merger review continues apace. Lots of uh, complaints um, from the Bureau about, uh, yet again, you know, as, as and I have some sympathy for this, but a lot of hand-wringing about the distortion uh, of the efficiencies defense, which we, I think, uh, uh, Judge Ginsburg mentioned, we share that with Singapore, which I actually didn't know. I knew we did at one time in any event share that defense with South Africa, but that does put us in a rather of a minority position. Um, but uh, the Bureau um, continues to say it needs more time, notwithstanding uh, when I was commissioner, uh, we were able to bring in a suspensory second request type of system, which was a big, big, very positive, I would say, from every perspective, uh, change to the to the Canadian law. Things about cartels have been relatively quiet. Um, in market misrepresentations, perhaps a little busier. Again, um, I'm just going to move here because that sun is getting really distracting. Um, I don't know if I'm getting any better. Um, and, uh, you know, there's a lot of obviously concern about, um, you know, markets, whether they be retail online, uh, retail online, uh, et cetera. Um, the big news, probably the biggest news is that there um, is real momentum behind a possible uh, very significant overhaul of the act. Um, we certainly um, have the Bureau um, recently, uh, in particular, um, pitching that they need new laws, not just tools to deal with the digitized world uh, and that they need them to align uh, with their trading partners. It, just by parenthetically, it's interesting. This is a bit of a departure. In fact, not a bit, it's a 180 uh, from where the Bureau was just as recently as a couple of years ago, where they were one of the agencies quite, um, quite emphatically saying they had all the laws they needed. They just needed more money for new tools and new intelligence gathering and the like. Um, they've definitely done an about face on this. Um, perhaps the uh, pending process of amendment and study was too much to resist, uh, but they've themselves recently put out a list of uh, 35 uh, wish list items, which really do uh, scan, uh, span rather uh, pretty much everything. Um, I think, you know, what is important is less that the, the Bureau is pushing for change um, that's not new. They've been talking about efficiencies and market studies and those sorts of things for quite some time. What's really um, exciting, uh, depending on your perspective, is that uh, the industry department, which is the one that actually has the policy function in Canada, uh, is has expressed and announced, and the Minister of Industry has announced that uh, they're going to do a comprehensive review of the Competition Act. Uh, that is a big deal. Um, once they announce it, um, you know, barring some real distraction, and I think it's going to take more than the many distractions, admittedly, we have right now politically, um, you know, something's going to happen. Uh, 
the um, in the announcement of the minister, several items were mentioned. The focus was not uh, entirely digital. I think that's um, important to note because that does really seem to be the preoccupation um, south of the border, um, or at least from my perspective. Uh, they do mention it, of course, uh, modernizing the laws so as to manage a digital economy, but there doesn't seem to be a sort of this uh, tsunami of interest in legislating certain sizes of mergers or addressing killer acquisitions, nothing of that sort of um, inflammatory tone. Uh, they do mention some very specific things like grip pricing, so some, some misrepresentation type of stuff that is obviously concern to consumers. Uh, they have uh, tightened onto the issue that wage uh, uh, fixing and no poach agreements are not criminal in Canada, and there has been some concern about that kind of instigated by some events that happened during the pandemic. So there seems to be some real momentum behind that change, narrow in a sense as it is, and, and picking and choosing groups, which is typically not the way we try to legislate in Canada, but it is an issue. Uh, and they also mention, you know, increasing fines. And I think very importantly, and, and certainly something that I've been concerned to see at least be debated is private rights of action for abuse of dominance. Um, and I think, you know, the, the, the minister is less, he's more vague than that. He talks about redress for those harmed by anti-competitive conduct, uh, but both in the form of penalties and other redress, I think that must mean private action, which is, I think, an important thing for us to, to, to discuss because it obviously is a very big departure from how private enforcement is conducted in the U.S. So um, the, the interest of the minister is very important. Um, the Bureau, as I said, has asked for the moon and more. Um, they want everything from uh, some of these, you know, more predictable topics, like they want market studies and compulsory production powers. Uh, they want um, uh, higher fines, private rights. And then they do tread into some territory that is a little troubling, I think, um, in so far as it's not been something we've talked about in the U.S., but uh, presumptions in merger cases, uh, a new model, a new framework for emerging entrance uh, in the context of mergers. So some things that I think, um, well, I certainly hope uh, have a lot of sober uh, reflection and consideration and consultation. Nothing's off the table. I think, um, again, the Bureau does not run this process and I think it bears saying, I think there can be a tendency to have a little echo chamber in the little competition world in Canada, which is much smaller uh, than it is in the United States that everybody thinks that what everybody in that little world is saying is so important and actually governs anything when that's not always the case. Um, there was a, a consultation launched by a Senator, Senator Weston, who was actually commissioner of competition. I, that was not what it was called in the day, but back in the uh, 90s, uh, he's a Senator and he independently struck a consultation which has its own little process going on in tandem with this minister's announcement. Uh, it's unclear yet who's going to really be directing or what the scope's going to be. But I think the important thing is this is a this is a government initiative. It's not a bureau initiative. It's not a senator initiative. It's up to the minister and the current government what they think uh, Canada needs. And, and in fairness, I, I have to say uh, we haven't seen that hysteria uh, in Canada about you know sort of the running around with their head cut off like we must do something to stop big is bad. Um, I, I, we, we make lots of mistakes. I think that's just one we're not making right now. And I, I think that's a credit to the government. They're being a bit more, um, well, I think a lot more um, measured uh, in how they're approaching it. And they're, they recognize they're grappling at the same time with big data and privacy issues. Uh, and I, I, other than some restive political scientists who, who, have, who do seem to have a little bit of a microphone uh, and the gift of a good phrase, um, we don't seem to have a whole lot of talk in Canada about shoving environmental and sustainability and in, income inequality type of issues specifically and directly into the competition legislation, which I think is a good thing, right? Um, well, I say right, because I know I'm among friends, um, but uh, I think sort of the traditionalists among us would, would say that that's a, a challenging th thing to do um, at best. So, you know, I think we're into a process. It's going to take some time. The government has suggested they might do a two-phase approach, maybe some of the more, you um, you know, like the wage fixing agreements or things that have a little bit of momentum politically may, might happen uh, first. And then there might be some prolonged, um, not prolonged in the sense of pejoratively, but longer uh, consultation on some of the more substantive amendments. I think my last word will be, I think one of the really interesting things to watch is if private rights of action do um, grow in Canada, how do they grow? Do they grow in our specialized tribunal? Um, I'm kind of with you, Alexander. I don't think we need specialized judges. I think, um, 
are just like the smart judges on the American courts. We our good smart judges can handle um, antitrust cases too. Uh, so do they go in front of the tribunal? Do they go to the general courts? And if they go to the general courts, uh, are we going to have class actions um, for abusive dominance, which you know is is quite a departure from where we are today? And while we have a relatively lazy plaintiff bar, they tend to like guilty pleas most of all. We do have a very low certification standard. And in some provinces, there's no cost consequences for bringing these cases. And so there could be, I'm not saying it'd be a bad thing, but there could be a very significant uh, departure to the kind of enforcement we have in Canada to really shift over to having a ton of private enforcement. So that's it for me. Melanie, that's exciting. I mean, what's all these th possibilities uh, that have, uh, am I am I muted? No, that have oh. opened up. And as you say, it's a government initiative and a parliamentary system that's 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 absolutely key. Um, so I just saw in uh, in the press yesterday, I think it was, that uh, the Data Protection Authority uh, now wants some a piece of this, let's say, uh, of this reform. They're concerned about the interaction between competition uh, matters and data protection, privacy in, in particular, uh, consumer protection. So um, you see that as part of the possible outcome here? I think anything and everything is on the table. Again, I, I don't want to sound like an apologist for our government, but I actually think we have a pretty strong policy function um, with some pretty bright people that aren't terribly politicized, which is really good. Um, Canada typically, you know, they're in this little they're kind of squished in, like they kind of, you know, they they uh, straight bigger than they are in some respects, um, but they're also, you know, right beside the United States and obviously have a different relationship with Europe. So I think to very typically they're, they cast about for, you know, what's the model that fits us best and what do we want to borrow? Um, they're not quite Australian striking quite as many um, blue ribbon panels, but um, they, do, they do study. And I think some reflection in this area is really smart. I don't think they're going to jump, but I do think, um, you know, that issue of whether those competencies are put into one or whether we try to keep silos and communication and coordination, but silos in terms of authority, um, I think it's very much an open question. Um, and it'll be interesting to watch and we'll certainly be influenced by what happens south of the border. Um, we always are. Uh, but I know they're also looking, as they always do, um, you know, at Australia, the UK, uh, and perhaps a little less to Europe, um, just in this area in particular, we don't, we're not quite as pro-regulation by default, not to say it can't happen. Well, just let me just get some brief clarification on a couple of points. You said you don't need a specialized tribunal or specialized judges, but you do have something like that, right? I mean, doesn't the- well, we have it. I just, yeah. I'm not giving, with all greatest of respect to the judges who sit on it, because they are special. I mean, we, we've been very lucky. We've had some very, very smart judges, but it's actually the judges on the tribunal who have the background. I think the design of the tribunal, which was to have economists and business people, as well as judges, has ended up not really adding much to the process. My own personal view, and again, I'm a litigator, not a policy wonk and not an economist, but my own personal view litigating cases is, um, you know, the more complicated you make the process and the design of the structure and the expertise that you bring, um, you sort of lose sight of what at the end of the day you need to do, either as the government or as the parties. You need to tell a story, a narrative that makes sense. And if it doesn't make sense to um, a generalist judge, maybe this isn't the case you should be bringing. Um, so my, I think one of the questions, I don't know that anybody's put it on the table, I'd put it on the table, is to question whether the tribunal is really the most effective um, body for resolving these disputes. There are some things under the Competition Act, um, not mergers, uh, not conduct, but that can go to the generalist courts. Um, I, I just, I guess I just question whether, you know, it has really worked out the way it was envisioned. It was a good idea. Uh, I'm not sure it was necessary. I'm not sure it's the most efficient way. Our, our mergers are taking, you know, they take 18 months to two years just to get a, a first hearing. Uh, and I think it's partly because everybody is so excited at the tribunal when they get a case and they sink their teeth into it and the economists get a hold of it. And with, again, with all due respect to that, you know, two economists in a room, three opinions, and then you have the judge getting their own expert. So the complication factor uh, for these cases, I don't think is consistent with efficiency and in, in something like mergers or, or frankly, abuse. If someone uh, is, you know, if, if consumers are suffering, that, that's not, not very good for Canadians. And then just lastly, um, you sort of went very quickly over your reference to um, 
distortion of the efficiencies defense distorting uh, merger analysis. And as you said, it, your, yours <clears throat> is unique, uh, unusual, perhaps unique in having this concern for total welfare. So what has been the consequence in brief of since you since superior uh, propane? The beginning of my antitrust career. Um, the, uh, you know, it's interesting. It's funny. I'm watching in the United States, obviously, a lot of um, questioning of whether we stick with the consumer welfare standard. And of course, we didn't even have that. We had total surplus. Um, I think right now, actually, if anything, we're sort of, should we move to what's good for consumers? Um, I could see one way of managing um, the efficiencies defense, if there were amendments, might be to say which, not to maybe to get rid of it, but maybe to say which efficiencies are the ones that count. So maybe it must be passed on to consumers, which, you know, are in prices or something along those lines. Again, unfortunately, we've got a code, so we're only going to make it more codified. I wish we could have more framework legislation, but we're not going to probably start there. We're going to start with what we have. So I could see the efficiencies uh, being diluted as a complete, def well, maybe not being diluted as a defense, but clarified uh, as to how it would operate as a defense. And that so would be a good thing for, I think, for everybody. So at present, a, uh, a merger that adds a great deal of concentration to a market might be, a would be approved if it also increases surplus that can be retained by the merged firm. It all counts. Uh -huh. So any resources released to the economy count. So um, that that that's the argument against it is that perhaps arguably, depending on your demand curve, um, all of you economists, um, you might have the most uh, concentrated mergers um, causing the greatest harm uh, and yet getting cleared because they create the greatest efficiencies. Interesting. Okay, very good. I do have a couple of questions. If I right. uh, one for Alessandra. Uh, and, and, and please cut me off if this has all been, been covered. Um, so I've noticed it's definitely a trend towards criminalization of cartels in, in Latin America. Um, but I haven't seen a whole lot of people being marched into the penitentiary system in, in Latin America. And it's certainly not because of a lack of cartels. And I wonder if there's something about... Um, uh, you know, about the culture or the legal system that makes people reluctant to actually uh, impose those kinds of uh, sanctions? Uh, Russell, I mean, um, every every cartel case is, is Brazil is criminal. Uh, it's, it's a crime cartel as well. So uh, every case that we, we judge here in, 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 in Kaji about cartels, we send to the federal prosecutors here or the state prosecutors. And they go and, and they go on with uh, uh, the procedures in order to prosecute also the uh, the, the personnel uh, as well. But uh, um, the judiciary sometimes take more time than the judge to judge some cases, uh, and and there is and and the penalty is a prison for um, they start with two years and uh, up to five years of prison uh, uh, who. Um, do a cartel in Brazil. And there is a law in Brazil as well. If you have this uh, the sentence uh, less than four years, you can change your uh, uh, penalty of prison in uh, service to the community. Uh, it's the restriction of your uh, liberty can be changed about restriction of rights. So that's why sometimes you don't see many people going to the J.O. in Brazil uh, because uh, they hit a cartel. But we do have a lot of uh, and good examples uh, of people going to, uh, to, uh, to, to jail because they made a cartel. A lot of, I think that the last, uh, the last, uh, 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 time that I saw the, the statistics of the people that were in jail because of cartel, we had in Brazil about 200 people in jail at that time. It was in 2017, I think. 200 people was in jail at that time that I looked. And we have a lot of uh, uh, criminal cases going on in Brazil uh, with the federal prosecutors. Um, I can I can actualize uh, uh, the the this data and 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 tell you later, but but I think that uh, this is still growing, uh, 
and and listen in brazil every time that you see a cartel uh maybe you see also a problem with public procurement corruption and other kind of uh crimes and the people when i'm talking about like 200 people not just uh cartels people that that are involved in another crimes as well and it's is you know sometimes you cannot uh, divide and, and realize it's just because of the cartel or because of the corruption. Uh, sometimes it's everything mixed. And when we uh, they go for a uh, crime, uh, uh, the infringement of public procurement and also other kind of crimes. So did you have another one as, as well? I, I did. As I, I came back in when Melanie was raising the question of whether the uh, the tribunal is the right solution uh, for Canada. And I know that there are as many systems for judging culpability as there are countries. One advantage which Canada has, as well as the United States, is there is a broad shelf of, uh, of jurisprudence, uh, well-staffed courts uh, who are able to take advantage of that. But in other countries, especially which have code systems, uh, they may not have as well resourced a judiciary, and it's a little bit harder. So I've noticed that in some countries, including uh, Mexico and Chile, uh, there is a specialized tribunal, but there actually has an exam you have to pass before you can be, uh, can be selected to it. And of course, other jurisdictions, including uh, 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 Brazil and, uh, um, and the, US, the USFTC, have an internal decision-making uh, process. So I think that there are lots of different ways to do it. And it's one of those things where, you know, everyone has a different opinion. Uh, I think that's one of the unresolved debates within this community as to what's the right way to decide this. Well, yes, and the, uh, I mean, the European Commission also, um, well, I shouldn't say also, they have a system in which in which uh, the internal proceedings are not before the ultimate decision maker. Uh, they're before a staff. Um, whereas the FTC is before at least before an administrative law judge who uh, conducts something that actually looks like a trial. Well, it is a trial. <laughs> uh, so there's yeah, yet another variation. Uh, Melanie? No, I, I, Russ, Russ is right. I think the only thing I would differ in, we do not have, unfortunately, the jurisprudence that the U.S. enjoys. I wish we did. And I think that's one of my, and I might be wrong. And I, as I said, I don't know that anybody else is talking about changing the tribunal. Um, but I think there's some real frustration because there's great intentions. And again, the, the, the chair is phenomenally devoted and committed and, and there's very good judges. It's not that. It's more just that you know, having its own separate world um, has not necessary. It has not realized the things we hoped it would, um, and I think you know has perhaps bogged us down a little bit um, in terms of getting jurisprudence. Uh, and the swiftness of the justice has not been there, uh, and that is a concern for me. Not just for the particular case, but we're not building the jurisprudence we need. Another reason why I think it's really important for us to talk about. Um, private enforcement, because at least then we'd have motivated plaintiffs and, you know, then it wouldn't be all up to the Bureau to have to bring the cases. Um, we'd get some law through private cases, which would be very, very welcome. Historically, and to this day, more than 95% of all the U.S. competition cases are brought by a private plaintiff. Is that right? I did not know yeah. that. I'm going to take yeah. that statistic into my yeah, <laughs> there are published statistics on this. Um, yeah, we depend very heavily upon private plaintiffs to vindicate the law. And in many cases, of course, the, the, I shouldn't say many, but not a high percentage, but there is a substantial minority of those private cases which are based on a public judgment, a public criminal, or part of per se violation uh, finding, uh, often criminal. And um, and so the follow up on behalf of consumers for damages then uh, is virtually automatic. Um, uh, Alexander, um, you talked about referring cases to the federal or sometimes the state prosecutors. And there are other agencies as well where uh, ultimately vindication depends upon cooperating, the cooperation of the prosecution service. 
uh, even in the UK, uh, matters get referred to the Crown Prosecution Service. And, uh, you know, sometimes that works very well, uh, sometimes not, depending on the relationship, upon the priorities of the prosecutor, the resources of the prosecutor. How, what was your experience in that regard over these years? Uh, the, uh, the, the Brazilian experience is uh, uh, regarding to relation with the prosecutors is great. I mean, it always has been great, uh-huh. and and this is one of one of the things that we we are kind of proud of that because when you talk to when we talked about this relation abroad, everybody say how can you make a very good relationship with the prosecutors? So and, <laughs> and what do we do? <laughs> we really do. And, and we have an agreement, a MOU, with all those 27 states in Brazil with the prosecutors and also federal uh, prosecutors. Um, and, and, and just, just for, uh, to have an idea what we do since 2003 in our law, to sign a lenience agreement, we don't need to, the federal prosecutor to sign with us. Because our law say that the the competence is just for Kaji. And when you sign the the, uh, the leanings, you don't have to go to the, judici- to the judiciary, ask for authorization, uh, and get the criminal immunity. If I want the criminal immunity, I just sign the lenience agreement without the federal prosecutors and without going to the judge. It's automatic. Mm-hmm. But... Since 2003, uh, when we start our lenience program in Brazil, with the first lenience that was signed in Brazil, we bring the federal prosecutors or the state prosecutors to sign the lenience with us. And this was a very important move because we put them inside of our analysis, not analysis, but we do the whole process just with Kaji. When the lenience or the historic are ready, I call the federal prosecutors or the state prosecutors and say, look what do we have here. Do you want to sign with us or not? And like 100%, yes, I like that. I want to sign with you. <laughs> and do you need that I change anything? And sometimes they ask, okay, for my case, my criminal case, it would be better if you change this, ask the party if you can bring this evidence, and we go back to the, to the parties and say, okay, this is a requirement from the federal prosecutors or the state prosecutors. Can you do that? And the party, okay, I can do that. We go back to the prosecutors and let's sign and so, and we have no questions about the 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 uh, if the the lenience is right or wrong. If we would like work for the criminal process as well or not, because uh, we solved the problem at the beginning. Even if there is some questions about the federal prosecutors or the state prosecutors, they have to sign or not the lenience program with you. We didn't discuss that. Okay, come and sign with us. It'll be good for everybody. And this made our, our relationship very good. Mm-hmm. Um, we, we, Kaji can do a down raid as well. And to do a down raid, we need to ask the uh, authorization uh, uh, from the judiciary. But we do together. And even if the case is not, uh, the case wasn't, uh, uh, we didn't start the case, was, uh, was started by the federal prosecutors. They ask Kaji to join them in the down raid because we know what is the good evidence to get in the companies and what we should do. Uh, and and when, we, when we brought like computers to Kaji or to the federal police, usually who, who analyze and extract the data is Kaji, not just the federal police, because we know which evidence we need. And this made... Uh, uh, the relation between Kaji and federal prosecutors is very good. And just to end this, um, Kaji is the only agency that has a representative from the federal prosecutors seated at the tribunal in Kaji. They are like, behind, like beside me in my right side in the whole section 
help us to judge the case, you know, uh, giving an opinion about every case and doing speeches. And this made us also work together and we need to have a good relationship. And historically, it's, it's just amazing. That's really terrific. And I, I mean, everyone asks you those questions. How do you work with the prosecutors? Because it's proved difficult in so many other jurisdictions. Um, I have a question that uh, uh, for Melanie and Alexander and Russell, you may have some, some uh, experience with this as well. The question is, how, how long has it, how often, how long has it been, what have you, since you are aware of a cartel that included an American firm, a U.S. firm? So let me start. Uh, Melanie, I I remember once, uh, 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 Doug, in, in, we were in Lisbon, you asked that question for me, and I, uh, you remember that? Uh, and, I, <laughs> and, I, and, I, and I said, so usually for the past years, we don't see uh, much of American companies join a cartel in Brazil. But we had one case, one big case, the bank cases. The, ex, uh, the currency cartel case. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And there were some uh, American banks uh, yeah. involved. That, that. Seems to be, that seems to be the major exception that people around the world have. have yes. Familiar yes. With. But, yes, but I don't see many American uh, companies, or uh, not many, I don't see at all uh, for the past years American companies join a cartel that is uh, uh, operating uh, in Brazil. And Melanie? Interesting question. I really hadn't asked myself in those terms before. I think certainly there's the LIBOR and those type of cases, yeah. but there's also, you know, we have the whole um, branch, um, branch plant subsidiary type of economy. So what will interestingly happen right. is that you will have a Canadian sub and part of the challenge for the Bureau will be that the documents, I mean, I don't know what stage we're talking about here, but it, let's just say there is actually a, a raid or a, there's an investigation. Um, the documents aren't necessarily in Canada. So there's constitutional, arguably, impediments to getting at them uh, and compelling them unless the Americans or other foreigners agree. Um, you may also not even have the um, executives in the Canadian branch aware, um, you know, depending on the seniority of them, they often are not the very highest level of the C-suite. So they may be participating unwittingly. Um, so that becomes an interesting issue on a personal culpability uh, level. It's also sometimes not, um, not actually... Um, there may be a sub of the American company, let's just say, but it or, or the Japanese company or whatever, uh, and it may not be implementing it in Canada. Um, and so the plaintiffs lawyers will, you know, pull their hair out trying to find evidence, but they may or may not ultimately be successful. And that may or may not be because they actually were not doing it in Canada, even though they're a sub of a U.S. company that may have pled guilty. Um, I've heard from a couple of practitioners, including one in Brazil, that um she had seen, and others told me, a carve out in a cartel agreement that says this will not operate in the U.S. <laughs> because of the concern with the penalties. Have you ever seen anything like that? Yeah, that's true. I have many cases here, and yeah. the cartel is operating in Europe or in in Asia, and they and they there is like a carve out at, yeah. at, at like at the lenience or in, in in the evidence to say okay. Let's do a cartel in abroad, last United States. I have I haven't seen this like a couple of times. Uh, Russell, any experience with this? Well, I, our, our colleagues at the Department of Justice managed to stay plenty busy with uh, U.S.-based cartels. But my sense is, from talking to people in other authorities, is that the U.S. and the European multinational firms tend to put a lot of effort into compliance training and you know, educating people that this is not okay. Now, do you ever have a salesman who, salesperson who kind of goes off the reservation? Yes, sometimes. Uh, sure. But largely this is a function of the sanctions leading to an uptick in, in compliance training or of yeah. compliance. Yeah, yeah, well, that was what was hoped for. Uh, I remember uh, one of my favorite anecdotes in this field is that uh, there was a Foreign Corrupt Practices Act case in the criminal division of the U.S. Department of Justice. 
And um, there was a uh, question was whether to charge the company. It was a major big name investment bank. The, the participant in the cartel, the employee of the bank, had gone through in 16 years, 32 compliance trainings. <laughs> so the division said, we're not going to charge the company. I mean, what more can they do? <laughs> They've got a guy here who's just not going to stop. <laughs> Um, and now the antitrust division has that ability to uh, to take that into account. Um, well, Judge, can uh, I go back oh, sure for a us. second to something sure. that was said earlier? I'll just take take a moment, and that was on the private right of action, uh, and how you talked about how many of the U.S. cases are that way. And one thing that that gives us in the United States that is not available in many places is the discretion to decide. What are the most important cases to go after? Because if, we, if we're the only door to redress under the Competition, of, uh, Competition Act, we would have to probably look at everything much more closely than we do. But the fact that there is a private right of action where we can send somebody down the street to the courthouse uh, means that the agency is freed up to focus on the things that are the most important. And from my point of view, that's one of the big arguments for the private right of action is it lets the competition agency do its job. Well, it's an interesting point. And I would suppose that you also get people um, coming to you, uh, not just to complain, but lawyers coming, hoping that you will bring a case so they can follow on with it. Yeah. Um, yeah, well, that's, that's, of course, that's lacking in so many places. Uh, although it's now becoming part of the environment in Europe in a way that that's yet to be fully developed, but it never was there before. It's quite a, a recent phenomenon, uh, including class actions in a few of the member states. Um, and then uh, uh, before I forget, Alexander, there's one thing else I wanted to ask you about. We, we've had the, the, we know that the Canada's, you know, I mentioned a data protection concern may filter into the competition review, competition law review. Um, U.S. companies are, are of any scale are complying with the GDPR from the European Com Commission. Um, and now California has uh, its own data protection law. Um, so I understand that you've written about this. And what is the status of this in, in Brazil now? Yeah, we do, we do have also a data protection uh, Brazilian law as well, but it's much more consumer protection than antitrust. So it's completely uh, separate from our role in CAGI. And there is the discussion whether we uh, do have to mix both issue or bring in uh, data protection to analyze um, antitrust issues. But I think that uh, in CAGI, we still look into data protection as a, uh, a consumer protection. Uh, more than antitrust, and the people who start to ask, but you should, you know, use data or privacy um, um, to abuse for abuse of dominance. But when when an, an abuse of dominance is can can you can you can start with uh, not just data, but whatever you have uh, come from everywhere. Uh, abuse of dominance is the general. And it can uh, with uh, be uh, with price, with uh, 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 input, with uh, uh, um, data protection, or whatever you do. And and but at the end of the day, we are looking for abuse of dominance, not data protection. For sure, if you have data and, and you hold the data, you don't let people have access uh, access to the data. This is an antitrust problem. But if you were like talking about data and privacy, about the quality of the product, we have to take care about this because our, we, we think that we never, uh, we were never good enough to talk about quality of the products of the service because this thing is very subject. And which is when you're talking about privacy, which is uh, uh, the optimal point? Is more, more privacy, less privacy, uh, it, we don't, I don't think that we have tools or skills to say if more privacy, less privacy is more quality, less quality. It depends on the case. It depends on the case. And this makes the antitrust decisions very 
uh, very uh, abstract and can you can put everything in. And so what is going on with uh, in Brazil right now, we, we're leaving these issues for the, the consumer protections and, and analyzing just uh, the, the new uh, um, law in Brazil about data when they are very related to abuse of dominance. But we don't need, we don't need the new law. If they are abusing, we need just the antitrust law. And because it doesn't matter if it's about data or whatever it is, it's abuse of dominance. We could go on, it's left to our, ourselves for quite a while here, but we've actually hit the end of our time. And so uh, it's uh, time for me, unfortunately, to say thank you uh, and goodbye. And I really appreciate the, the effort you put into the to this uh, seminar this uh, panel discussion. I think it's been great. And I should tell you that uh, it will be, it has been recorded. And as you know, it will be posted and available to uh, anybody on the web uh, at the Global Antitrust Institute website, uh, which is uh, gaai.gmu.edu. Melanie, thank you so much. Alexander, thank you, Russ. I hope to see you all in person in the near future. It's been far too long. I think maybe Lisbon was our last time together two years ago. So. Yes. Bye time. <laughs> so. thank, you. Thank, 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 thank you. Thank you all. Thank you very much. Thanks so Have much. And thank you. A real pleasure. Bye, Bye now. Bye-bye.